At a recent Theology on Tap in Pasadena, an Orthodox priest stated that, according to canon law, he was in communion with Rome, and that therefore he didn't need to be converted to Rome. Mr. Coulomb affirmed both of those statements. I can guess. he elaborate? I can. What's the next one? Oh, uh, uh, is <laughs> uh, okay, I thought we were going to... Okay. <laughs> All right. Is submission to the Roman pontiff not an, an uh, essential requirement of membership in the church? It is. Uh, and Father Feeney said that this membership could not be produced by implicit desire. That is correct. Okay. Now, let's take him from the back forward. Mm -hmm. Implicit desire is just that. It's not conscious. So we're not talking about that. We're not talking about someone who's vaguely a member of the church even though he doesn't know he is. So we can say goodbye to that. Uh, secondly, it is true that membership in the church is dependent upon one's acceptance of papal supremacy. Now notice something interesting, however, and this goes to the very heart of what the Eastern Schism is about. There are two parts to any, to any well, to any sin, but also to any schism. The canonical fact of it, and your own internal form, your own mindset. Uh, the fact is that Canon 844 allows Catholics to receive communion from the Orthodox. Why is this? It's because their orders are valid. Why are their orders are valid? Why are their orders valid? Why does Christ come down on their altars? Mm -hmm. Well, there's a reason for it. The reason is that they are a church in the sense that the Protestants are not. But here's the thing. They're very divided. Now, juridically speaking, the schism that we speak of began not in 1054, which is the day people like, mm -hmm. but in 1453, when the Sultan of Turkey appointed a new patriarch of Constantinople for the purpose of breaking the Union. Now, that's a little problematic because you have to presume, A, that he had the right to uh, appoint a patriarch and B, that that patriarch had the right to break the Union. Mm -hmm. But in any case, in 1964, Paul VI, the Patriarch of Constantinople, lifted both sets of excommunications, which were the entirety of the juridical basis of the, ex uh, of the schism. Mm. So I would tell you that juridically, the schism no longer exists. Well, what's left? What's left is what any given Orthodox thinks about it all. Uh, you know that when Orthodox formally become Catholics, you know what's required of them? What? That they go to confession and communion. That simply shows their communion with their own pot. Uh, any Orthodox priest who accepts the, the, uh, the headship of the Pope over the Church is a Catholic. Any Orthodox priest who believes, or any Orthodox layman who believes that our orders aren't valid, mm -hmm. like the Archbishop of uh, Piraeus in Greece, or that we're heretics that with this or with that, he indeed is a schismatic. Mm -hmm. But that's on him. Oddly enough, Catholicism has become that way. Heresy is so widespread that a great many people who consider themselves Catholics aren't really. They're not formal heretics, but they're material heretics. It's true. So uh, this was all epitomized for me by the Serbian lady I met, mm -hmm. who very dramatically told me that uh, she had gotten from the liturgy that the Pope had to be head of the church, and from the prayers for the dead that there had to be such a place as purgatory, and that her priests were simply wrong. Uh -huh. uh, line that up against uh, my, uh, my cardinal at the time, who declared that in the simple acts of breaking the bread and blessing the cup, Christ is present in memory and in hope. Well, which one of these two was Catholic? Ah. The Serbian Orthodox lady or the Roman Cardinal? Fortunately, I'm not the judge of the living and the dead, so I don't have to make that determination. But... Uh, what if some people say neither? Why does one have to be in the, in the church? Uh, well, that's a good question. We'll find out what you are when you die. <laughs> but no, seriously, uh, you know, it, it, what, I, what I'm saying is that Orthodox who accept the Pope as head of the Church, who accept the Catholic Church as the Church, 
are themselves Catholic, regardless of where they go to uh, the liturgy. They are in communion with the church, albeit uh, and not in some weird, mysterious way, mm-hmm. but in a simple, flat-out kind of way. This is why, for instance, uh, the Father Fyodor Wokak, S.J., who uh, was the Russian Rite priest here in El Segundo, and a friend of Father Phoenix, though he was a great believer in Extra Ecclesia and mm-hmm. he said that uh, he would never refuse an Orthodox communion because he knew that any Orthodox that would come to a Catholic priest to receive was already in the right frame of mind. Right. Because they know the difference, believe you me. Mm-hmm. Uh, secondarily, the, uh, the, uh, I, one, on the occasion of my, one of my father's requiem masses, a Russian friend of mine, uh, asked me if we were all right for him to receive. And I said, well, it is under our law, but your priests would consider it an act of, uh, very likely, because the kind of orthodoxy it was, your priests would very likely consider it an act of schism or even heresy. Mm-hmm. And his response was, well, if you don't tell them, I won't. So the orthodox are in a very strange and peculiar place as regards us uh, and vice versa. Um, I, the older I get, the more I come to realize that the great schism is not only an ongoing sin crying out to heaven for vengeance, it's also its own punishment. When you consider the terrible damage it's done to both Catholics and Orthodox on the frontiers of Christendom. Right. So what else we got? Well, one last caveat uh, for the, that last sentence. Uh, yeah. He says, and Father Feeney said that this membership could not be produced by implicit desire. That is correct. I don't like when people say stuff like, Father Feeney said. Anything Father Feeney said, he said because it's in the magisterium. No. The magisterium says, not Father Feeney. Father no. Feeney did not just make it up out of, out of the no, air. Out of I, I, would, I would say uh, I would, it could not be implicit. In, uh, produced by implicit desire, I would say that the Athanasian Creed it says, says it pretty that. Clearly, yeah. So it's not Father Feeney, it's no. Athanasian Creed. Father Feeney was not uh, the Oracle of Delphi. <laughs> no, he, he wasn't. He would have been the first to say that. But the, the whole thing about uh, implicit desire, remember, is that it's unconscious. It's very important to bear that in mind. Uh, usually defined as someone, implicit baptism of desire, as it's called, is defined as somebody somehow wanting to do God's will, do the right thing, do good, and he's saved by that obscure desire. Mm-hmm. Um, but it has nothing to do with the church and nothing to do with the sacraments, which is the um, garden definition of Pelagianism. So when the Holy Father condemns Neo-Pelagianism as rampant in the church, he's right. Okay.